So we'll travel from Canada to Europe, and our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jurgen Beck, who's a good friend of mine. He's a neurosurgeon. He's a uh, professor of neurosurgery and chairman at the University of Freiburg, that's in Germany. Uh, I met Jurgen uh, several years ago in Bern, in Switzerland, where he worked at the time. Uh, and actually, thanks to him, uh, we started this uh, intracranial hypotension uh, symposium because he had a tremendous two or three day uh, conference uh, about CSF leaks, and I, and I have very fond memories of that. Um, Jurgen has, uh, just like me, he's originally a vascular neurosurgeon, uh, and he's really one of the very, 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 very few neurosurgeons who uh, have a real uh, passion uh, for uh, intracranial hypotension and CSF leaks. Uh, and he will be talking uh, to us about some objective measurements uh, that he has used for many years, uh, particularly uh, CSF outflow resistance. Uh, Jurgen. I'm happy. I'm happy to be here, and thank you, Walter, for this very kind invitation and introduction. And also thank you, Connie DeLine, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present our, our data from Bern and from Freiburg. So are there any objective measurements? Schaltenbrand, who was probably not the first, but one who really wrote an amazing paper about a lot of the stuff we are talking about today and discussing, is in this paper young people even getting comatose, using intrathecal saline as a rescue therapy. That's all in this paper. And <clears throat> the reason I'm showing this is because he was talking about the pathophysiology. Maybe we should find some more objective measures to get a clue and a hint what this fascinating disease is about. Currently, we are diagnosing spontaneous idiopathic hypertension according to the ICHD. Classification, headache, autostatic headache as the, as the mainstay uh, combined with low pressure or evidence of leaking. I think the former speakers already mentioned that low pressure is not mandatory and also in our series I think 60% do not have low opening pressure. But of course evidence on CSF leaking on imaging <clears throat> is diagnostic and already over time I think we modify the criteria for SAH, also patients with what you call symptoms, autostatic symptoms, um, um, qualify for this disease. So, um, despite its name, hypotension, um, this nice diagram from, from Peter Kranz shows that is, it looks more random than diagnostic, and also over time, this is very important, I come to that later, timing is very important. It changes over time. So opening pressure is not really diagnostic, but in SIH, what is, at least for this talk, the, the basis of the disease, it's the spinal CSF leak. It might be academic very interesting, and I believe in that there is, might be an SIH without a leak. Maybe it's the compliance or the elastance or a difference in the drainage of the venous system. Very, very interesting, but to start, to start with uh, uh, clear definitions, in this talk I will use the definition of a spinal CSF leak for SIH and for the patient's group. So we start with lumbar infusion testing, and the rationale is clear. If you have a system with a hole, it should behave differently than a system without a hole. So a CSF leak clearly should alter all normal CSF parameters, and a CSF leak implies a low resistance to outflow. And there are studies um, investigating CSF outflow, resistance to outflow. This is an original image from Katzmann and Husse from the neurology paper 1970. And these studies have been done for another CSF disorder for hydrocephalus, for normal pressure hydrocephalus. And they tried to quantify the CSF dynamics, uh, searching for objective criteria when to indicate CSF shunting and when not. Um, I'm not a physicist, luckily, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, the, uh, Professor Chosnicka from Cambridge and Tony Marmoreau, they did all the work, and of course you can describe and, and quantify the parameters of 
how CSF is absorbed, reabsorbed, and what the outflow resistance is. This is a typical result of um, uh, uh, RCSF outflow testing. And you see at the beginning there is some, some baseline, baseline variance, and then you start the infusion. You put a needle in the system, you start the infusion, and you get a pressure um, response. And it's typically an, an increase until you reach a plateau. And um, that's basically how, how such a system looks like. And they try to find out how high does the plateau have to be for indication for shunting. And so we applied the same system in, I think it's uh, the, the uh, logical step to apply it in low, low uh, pressure syndromes in SIH. And you should have an altered CSF response once a patient has a leak or once a patient has no leak. And this is computerized nowadays. We use the ICM Plus version from Professor Chosnika from Cambridge. So we typically infuse uh, 50 cc's of Ringer's lactate and um, get these uh, re results. Above there is a, a healthy control, and you see this is just a, when we turn on the machine, the needle resistance, and then it starts and it reaches a plateau, a normal curve. And here is a prototypical patient with SIH. It looks completely different. There is no plateau at all anymore, and you uh, don't even reach an endpoint. Then the syringe is, is, is empty, all the ringless lactate is in, and still you have very low pressure, and it looks completely different than uh, normal healthy control. So, um, again, for this study, the gold standard to discriminate the two patients group was the presence of a CSF leak or not, and the presence was uh, determined by either extracecal contrast after intrathecal contrast application or by direct visualization during microsurgical treatment of the leak. For the first study, we included 31 patients and um, again, 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 lumbar opening pressure at the beginning is non-diagnostic. So 60% of patients had levels above the six centimeter of water as suggested by the diagnostic criteria. RCSF out is way better. Only 14% of patients were above a threshold we arbitrarily defined. I think there is no literature about the RCSF out in SAH patients, so we just started and it, uh, uh, took five as a threshold, which is uh, very well in, the, uh, in accordance to the literature with normal data from hydrocephalus patients. So it's better. Just to compare, lumbar pressure at baseline is significantly different between the two groups. And lumbar pressure at plateau, this is once you reach the plateau, you have um, that the plateau pressure is also significantly different between uh, patients uh, with a spinal CSF leak, with a proven spinal CSF leak, and uh, the ones without the proven spinal CSF leak. <coughs> Same goes for the pressure at plateau, and also the pulse amplitude at baseline and plateau. The pulse amplitude is just how does the system react to the cardiac cycle, to the amount of blood that is entering the intracranial space during each, inter, during each cardiac cycle? What, how is the system reacting? And this is different at baseline and at uh, plateau, and also the two groups are different for these parameters at baseline and at plateau. So here you see the graphical. Now coming to the resistance to CSF outflow, which uh, this were we looking for when, when we started uh, doing lumbar infusion testing. And uh, it's highly significant difference. Uh, it's 11.7 in uh, when there, once there is no CSF leak, and it's very low. The CSF is just oozing out in patients with a proven spinal CSF leak. So we thought we are, were very lucky. This is the clue to diagnosing SIH. It's not, as I show you later, it's just one helpful tool, but in this first group, uh, all acute patients, the area under the, the curve for a diagnostic test is excellent, 0 0.958. This is very way better than just uh, using the opening pressure. The LS tans, the stiffness, uh, more parameters are also uh, not different, but not significantly different, so the LS tans doesn't seem to be the problem. 
Um, also, the pressure volume index, this is the, the volume uh, you need to increase um, the pressure tenfold, the standard parameter in this testing. There's a difference between the two groups and so on. So this is just an overview of all what we did and there is just a specific typical pattern in patients with SIH and uh, the RCSF out is the most logical and most intuitive parameter and clearly discriminates patients from um, controls in the acute state. As I told you, a specific pattern is there, and uh, the nice thing is that it's investigator independent, it's done computerized, and the RCSF out might be a very valuable diagnostic parameter, an objective parameter. What else did we do in, in Bern and in Freiburg? Trying to, to get, uh, to quantify, to measure this disease, we've looked at uh, optic nerve sheaths. And it's very well known that the optic nerve, the width of the optic nerve sheath correlates with intracranial pressure. It's known in trauma, in stroke, in large ICH patients. The, the higher the intracranial pressure, the wider the optic nerve sheath is. And it's, I mean, it's the same subarachnoid um, fluid that's here in the sub subarachnoid space around the optic nerve. And you can measure it. This is just a transorbital ultrasound, it's very easy, even we as surgeons can do it. We just used the stolen the machine from anesthesia in the beginning, now we have a known machine, and you, really everybody can do it. It's just the, 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 the eye is here, this is the retina, and three millimeter behind the retina, it's standardized. Um, perpendicular to this line, you measure the width of the optic nerve sheath. This is the optic nerve, and here is subarachnoid fluid, this is a subarachnoid space. And of course, if there is a dependency from intracranial pressure, it should be different in patients than in healthy controls. And so why it is not used? And we also did it, and it was very disappointing, because there was no difference at all. The patients and healthy controls had ex exactly the same width of the optic nerve sheath. So what did we do? It's very simple. Just measure twice. When do you have symptoms and problems while standing up? So just measure twice, and you can easily do it while you're sitting or standing or upright, and suddenly, of course, we have uh, a significant difference. And we did this in the first group in 44 patients and discriminate them whether they have orthostatic headaches or not. And surprise, there was a big difference in the supine and upright position. So the optic nerve sheet kind of collapses in symptomatic patients while standing. So this is one example, um, the optic nerve sheet with supine and upright in a patient with SIH while being supine and while being upright. So the, the only trick was to do the examination twice while first lying and then standing only seconds after the, uh, assuming the upright position and you really see the collapse of the optic nerve sheath. This, is, um, this was done in patients with and without headache, and we did some controls, just uh, disc herniation patients on the, on the ward, and there's a clear difference between symptomatic patients, asymptomatic patients, and normal controls. And also, we did it in a better defined population, that is a population um, before microsurgical and after microsurgical closure of a known leak. So, um, and again, the symptomatic patients before surgery with a proven leak had a collapse of the optic nerve sheet with before surgery and after surgery. The day after surgery or the week after surgery doesn't matter. This difference what immediately dissolved. They had a, a, a no more collapse of the optic nerve sheet with after assuming an upright position. So these are the results graphically. Uh, before surgery and after surgery, it immediately changes. So this is not now that we have a diagnostic test, not at all, because the variation is, is very big. But what we have at hand here now is a follow-up test, a very cheap, non-invasive follow-up test. And we do it in all patients, and you get a feeling for the width of the optic nerve sheet. You have, if you have a tall 
tall patient with a very small optic nerve sheet, you immediately know, oh, it might be very well a candidate, and SAH might very well be the problem. And you can easily discriminate after treatment, for instance, after blood patching or after surgery, between is the leak still open or rebound hypertension headache, which is clinically uh, not always so clearly to discriminate. Uh, with uh, ultrasound, you can clearly discriminate these two entities, I think. Okay, coming to MRI, um, of course, uh, Wouter gave us the SEEP neomics with the uh, typical findings we all know and have described. So, and now we try to, to quantify these, these signs on imaging and on imaging on brain MRI, typically the first study that is done um, in the workup of SIH. And Thomas de Brocki and Ike Bichowiak really are two brilliant young neuroradiologists, I, I think, a lot of work will come from, from, from them. Um, started now, and we submitted the paper. I would like to, to give you um, the first results. This is, of course, when we do it, at what point of time, our diagnostic workup protocol. We follow a stepwise protocol in Freiburg and in Bern how to approach these patients. And um, for this special population for quantification of MRI findings. We only use patients where we really have um, a CSF leak. So all these uh, over 100 patients got dynamic studies, dynamic myelography or uh, dynamic myelocity. Um, to, to start, I mean, it's not a solution, but to start, we have an academically a clear, clear two patient groups. We again have chosen to, to take patients with a proven spinal CSF leak further patients or healthy, healthy uh, individuals without um, a spinal CSF leak, but all have undergone the studies. So for this study, 100 uh, patients were evaluated and only 56 were taken then where we could prove a CSF leak and had adequate brain MRI imaging and additionally added 60 healthy controls and um, added 20 prospective patients that we validated with a score once we had established him over the last month. Again, just for academic reasons, for this population, we defined the gold standard to be a CSF leak, um, and they are only allowed to be included once we detected extrathecal contrast after intrathecal contrast application, no matter whether it's uh, uh, during a CT or Milo or gadolinium with MR, or whether we directly have seen the leak during microsurgery. The signs are all well known, and we took all these present signs and we, we weighed them. And after, for instance, um, looking at inter uh, inter-observer reliability and a lot of statistic backwise, regression, step forward, whatsoever, we, we took out the most valid signs. And we put this one further, we adjusted points to these most valid uh, signs. So we have uh, major criteria and minor criteria. And so we come up with a scoring system from zero to nine. And for instance, uh, we have qualitative signs and quantitative signs and uh, quantitative signs yeah, they are all well known, but they came up with uh, easy memorizable numbers, even for a surgeon, it's four, five, six, five, you can memorize that. For the supracellar system, four, for the preprotein system, five, and for the mamillopontine distance, 6.5 millimeters as a threshold found by elaborate statistical methods. And to give you the results, so all these six criteria are highly significant and have a certain coefficients to predict the presence of a spinal fluid. And um, to, just to compare it briefly, don't go into the detail, um, with other studies that are present, um, the, the results are very well in line with what, what is published, for instance, 83% dual enhancement, so it still leaves 20% with SIH that have no MRI-specific sign, but if you combine all these and use qualitative and quantitative data and use the score, we might come up with groups. And the groups, uh, for instance, with a, with a score of five or, or higher, have a very high likelihood of having a spinal CSF leak. And 
This even might hold true for the other very interesting patient population, namely SAH patients with a leak and still SAH patients without a leak. And still, the diagnostic accuracy might be very high. But of course, these are um, data that I would like first to share. And I would like to invite you to run your databases with this core. And we'll see whether it holds true or not, or whether we can even improve the score. But we have numbers now. We have numbers of uh, sensitivity and specificity for patients in their respective groups. And for instance, if you have uh, a score of five or higher, you have a sensitivity of 78% and almost a specificity of over 98%. And now you can compare the data with data from the literature, or you can, for instance, um, form groups, low probability, intermediate probability, or high probability groups, which can, of course, guide treatment or guide whether um, which patients will need further invasive diagnostic testing uh, with radiation and, and contrast and so forth. The same holds true for the validation cohort. Um, please be careful with these numbers. This, are just, uh, this was the last 20 patients we saw over the last months in Bern. Um, but it seems to hold true, and this would be very helpful also in SAH patients, whether they have a spinal CSF leak or not. And of course, uh, the diagnostic accuracy um, is, for at least at the moment, quite good, and we are quite optimistic. Um, also, the other way around, if you combine all these signs, not telling oh, uh, one sign is uh, not diagnostic, if you combine it, in, the, in this group of over 100 um, patients, no patient with a proven spinal CSF leak had a normal brain MR score of 0 or 1. Okay, skip again to, to the um, lumbar infusion testing and to timing. I think timing is very important in this disease, at least what I've learned over the last years, and is a little bit neglected. So we know that the uh, diagnostic criteria, low CSF pressure, is not really diagnostic, and we know that uh, normal CSF pressure is coming in our series, and Peter Kranz has reported is up to two-thirds of patients has, have normal pressures, and lumbar infusion testing might be useful for that. Um, again, the, the diagram out of the paper, um, it's not only not diagnostic, it's also, it seems to change over time, at least a little bit. And the opening pressure increases with time. And we all know, of course, that the orthostatic nature of headache uh, becomes less and less obvious as the disease advances. So this is an arbitrary um, definition now we just use to, to, to try to, to start to get solved this problem, natural history of SAH. We divided three groups. Acute is what we called 10 weeks, subacute 11 weeks to one year, and chronic patients over one year. And now we've updated our infusion testing database. We have then done this last year with uh, almost 140 number infusion tests. And again, just to be scientifically correct, now we're talking about patients with a proven spinal CSF leak versus non-proven. And all these patients underwent dynamic studies. So it's, I think it's a very hard or very well-defined group. And um, to, according to our arbitrary definition, we had 29 acute patients, 21 subacute patients, and 19 chronic patients. And 68 all through the stepwise diagnostic protocol in Freiburg and Bern without a leak. There are 12 SAH patients according to ICDH and 56 without a diagnosis. And this is a result which is very interesting. There is, um, if you look at this, this is our arbitrarily defined threshold of 5 millimeter resistance to outflow. And in the acute phase, almost all patients seem to be very easily diagnostic, uh, diagnosed. Almost all patients have an RCSF out below five. In a subacute phase, suddenly it's 50-50. Almost half of the patients have an RCSF out higher than five. And uh, surprisingly, in the chronic phase, almost all patients, patients with SIH and a proven leak at the time of the test suddenly have an RCSF out even higher so this was new for me or for us and uh, very intriguing. So this is just another uh, um, 
depiction of the lumbar pressure at baseline of the same group, and you see also for the lumbar pressure, for the opening pressure, there's a time dependency, and acute, subacute, and chronic, chronically, the, the opening pressure is increasing, but not reaching the niveau of the, of the control group. But again, the RCSF out um, is highly statistically significant different over time, and in the chronic patients, interestingly, even way higher than the uh, value of the normal controls. Just uh, two examples we measured two times. Out of this uh, 150 patients with infusion testing, we were lucky into uh, doing two tests without closing the leak in between. It's just a natural history. And you see um, a steep increase in RCSF out over time. And there is also an association between the type of headache. Of course, you all know that in the acute phase, um, almost all patients have typical orthostatic headaches, and in the chronic phase, this wanes, and many, many patients, almost half, have atypical headaches. Or the other way around, we looked at this group with infusion testing and um, divided them by typical or atypical orthostatic headache, and the lumbar baseline pressure was significantly different in patients with typical versus atypical orthostatic headaches, and even more pronounced, the uh, RCSF out was different in patients with typical orthostatic headaches versus atypical headaches. This is just an association. We cannot prove any causal relationship, but I think it's very interesting. And um, the most interesting or most surprising is what would you suspect what happens with the CSF production rate? Of course, patients are getting better. Um, the headache is not so orthostatic anymore. Of course, maybe one defense mechanism is increasing production rate. It's the other way around. So this is a CSF production rate. You can calculate it with a ICM plus, with a standardized lumbar infusion testing. You can calculate the CSF production rate. And it's higher, way above normal limits in acute patients, decreases, and chronic patients have a CSF production rate in the normal range. So, lump infusion testing, disappointingly, is very time dependent, but this opens up a chance to understand the disease better and to see, or maybe to get clues uh, that there are, at least for the moment, we know there is something biologically going on that's changing. It's not just coping with the disease and the symptoms change because we cope with the disease, but there is something going on and um, they show clearly a different profile of CSF fluid dynamics in the chronic phase. And we currently don't know or can only speculate what's the natural history, what's the compensatory mechanism behind this phenomenon. Yeah, what I also like is the, the imaging analysis and so um, this is at least the approach in, in, in Freiburg and in Bern. We try to find or try to evaluate some objective measures and therefore we use lumbar infusion testing and we use uh, uh, ultrasound of the optic nerve in two body positions, very cheap, very good follow-up tool and we try to quantify and to give numbers uh, how, is, how high is the likelihood of finding a spinal CSF leak with a typical initial brain MRI. Of course, many people stand behind these projects. Uh, first of all, of course, my friend and mentor, um, Andreas Rabe. I think he's one of the best neurosurgeons in the world. And of course, the team in Bern is, is uh, very large. Jan Grala, he relentlessly was looking for the CSF leaks in the beginning without his help. It would never have been possible to include such many patients and all the neuroradiologists, neurologists, and all the people helping us. And now in Freiburg, we have already a big team. Um, Horst Urbach is, I think, the most experienced neuroradiologist in Germany, and I'm very privileged that he is already in Freiburg, so we're working together, and I'm very happy to, to see more patients and uh, also include, of course, neurology, even ophthalmology, to, to advance our understanding. And thank you for your patience. Yeah.